your monthly dose of astronomy news and views. This is Awesome Astronomy. Hello and welcome to Awesome Astronomy, episode 13 for July 2013. The ill-fated mission to the moon that suffered an onboard explosion that'll keep you gripped until the end of the show to discover whether mission control in Houston are able to get the crew of episode 13 back. I'm Ralph, your host for this month's show, and joining me is the ever-erudite Paul. Hello, um, was that a bad attempt at an Apollo 13 joke? <laughs> it might have been. <laughs> okay, in this episode for July, we're cramming a packed summer of astronomy into the show, and we start off with Paul's roundup of what to look for yourselves in those now gradually lengthening night skies. We have an amendment to the Goldilocks zone and a roundup of this month's astronomy news. We'll be exploring the magnificent globular clusters in our five minutes concept, we have an interview with a project scientist for the European Space Agency's ExoMars mission to specifically look for life on Mars, and we'll round things off with Q&A, where you get to dictate the show. And we're getting more interactive too. Yeah, we'll be looking on the Twitter and the Facebook group as we record this, and if we get any messages that you just have to know about, we'll read them out. And actually, we do have a message on the Facebook group referring to us as a target of faraway laughter, which I think's riffing on a Pink Floyd theme. Is that Shine On You Crazy Diamond? Yeah, I, I think it is. I think it is. Which one of us is Sid Barrett, then? <laughs> Not me. And we got an email earlier today from Richard Garner at the Space Collective, who's involved in the first North West Astronomy Festival, which is being organised in the northwest of England for the 26th and the 27th of October. And it said that this event will include a beginner's corner with advice and guidance. There'll be presentations and lectures by big names in astronomy. There'll be planetarium shows and a trader's exhibition hall. There'll be an Ask an Astronomer and Astronomer's Question Time, and all the profits from the event are going to be going towards funding programmes of education for young people that are disengaged from learning. And also the Space Collective are going to be putting together a Space and Science Pact to send out to schools and clubs for free. And they say that that'll contain materials that have been flown in space, there's going to be real pieces from the Space Shuttle and all sorts of objects that are designed to get children interested in space and astronomy. And that offer is going to be open to schools, science clubs, scouts, astronomy clubs, and just about any organisation who has a hand in the night sky. So we wish you all very well with that event. And if anyone's interested in this initiative, you can go to the Knowledge Observatory website at www.thenowledgeobservatory.com. Yeah, that's, uh, that sounds like a really worthwhile course to get involved in. Yeah, it really does. And we want to be more interactive, so for future shows, you can get stuff to us by joining the Awesome Astronomy Facebook group or by tweeting us at Awesome Astro Pod. So in answer to Lisa Mather's question on Facebook asking when this podcast will be released, we now record during the last week of the month for a release on the first day of each month. Then we'll put the actual time and date of recording on the Facebook group and on Twitter beforehand so you'll know when to get in touch. Anyway, on with the show. So, Paul, July's not traditionally seen as a good month for observing, for the obvious reason. So how have you been making the best out of these short nights? Um, well, I mean, the weather's not been that great, has it? Um, it has been particularly bad it's recently. It's been pretty nasty. Well, nasty is the wrong word. I think it's just been boring weather, hasn't it? I mean, it's it's just been grey and miserable. Yes, yeah, so few opportunities to do any kind of observing or imaging or sketching in your case. Mm. Yeah, I've had a few a few short nights worth of observation. A um, bit of the Summer Triangle, um, some of the basics, Ring Nebula. M13. Yeah. yeah, it's really nice now that we've got those summer constellations starting to come up. We've got mm. Lyra and uh, and Cygnus, and uh, I had a go at imaging the Ring Nebula the other night from central London, trying to have a go at oh. uh, really light polluted sky imaging through uh, narrowband filters, and uh, still waiting to see how that comes out. But we've still got Saturn up there, and I think you'll be talking a bit about Saturn Will later be, on. Yeah, Saturn's still up there, still still blazing away, still looking nice, but we're, we're going to lose it soon. But we'll have more of that in the Sky Guide. This is Awesome Astronomy. Okay, well, let's get into the Sky Guide section and find out what we can look out and up for throughout July. Paul. Well, first, the really good news. The moon howlers and homeopathy freaks have had their day in the sun, though it was cloudy, and we are finally through the summer solstice, so every night that goes by is longer and darker. That said, July is certainly not famed for its long, dark nights, and the window of observation is still a short one. So, repeating what I said last month, it's still a good time to get out there and look at our nearest star. Of course, taking all the necessary precautions, never look directly at the sun, and always get advice before you attempt any observations. If you've been looking at the sun regularly this year, you may notice that we are now at aphelion, which occurs on the 5th of July, where Earth is at the furthest point from the sun on its orbit. This will mean the sun appears slightly smaller in the eyepiece than it did back in January at perihelion. I think Northern Hemisphere observers often find this a bit counterintuitive, as the sun is further away in their summer and closer in the winter. 
the difference is only 10.42 million kilometres, which is not a great amount compared to the average distance of 146.9 million kilometres. It makes some difference to the amount of energy arriving at Earth, but it's not dramatic. Hopefully, despite its greater distance, you can all enjoy a bit of sun over July, even if it's just the relaxing the garden chair variety of sun observation. So, on to the planets. We're working our way out of the drought as time goes on, and if you're an early riser, then the sky is improving for planetary watchers. If you were fortunate enough to catch the triple conjunction at the end of May, and that was pretty spectacular, then there is a repeat before dawn from the middle of the month, with Mars filling in for Venus in the company of the re-emerging Jupiter and Mercury. All three will be sitting in the constellation Gemini, which will rise around 4am, and if you start looking to the northeast around this time from the middle of the month, you should hopefully start picking them up, with Jupiter and Mars rising first. You'll have less than an hour to observe this before sunrise, although this will improve as the month progresses. The 25th of July onwards looks to be the best period to observe this. If it's anything like the Jupiter-Venus-Mercury event at the end of May, then it's definitely worth the early morning, or pulling that all-nighter. Mm -hmm. Moving further afield onto the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune. We should be getting good and ever-improving views with these two throughout July, with Neptune sitting in Aquarius and approaching opposition next month, while Uranus is following behind in Pisces. Now, of course, unless you have a very large aperture, you're not going to see much except a small blue-green-grey disc, but don't let this put you off having a look. We are talking about two of the most mysterious and barely explored worlds at the furthest reaches of the solar system, and that has got to be worth a look. By the end of the month, both Neptune and Uranus will have risen before midnight for most of the northern hemisphere, so we are soon approaching the point where they will be evening objects. At more sociable hours, we still have Saturn in the evening sky, and despite being well past its best and approaching the evening glare of the setting sun, it is still always worth a look. The rings have been well presented, this apparition, so do enjoy your last good views before we lose out to the sun. Then there's Venus, that will be a pretty dominating sight in the evening sky, blazing away at magnitude minus 3.8 in Cancer. It'll be presenting between a 90 and 80% phase through the month, and with colour filters you should hopefully be able to pick out some cloud detail. Of course, what this means is that in the last week of July, if the weather is kind, we have a window of opportunity to view all seven planets over one night. A good challenge for imagers and observers alike. The Moon, always worth an observing session, presents European observers with two nice bright occultations. Occultations occur when the Moon moves in front of a star or planet, and is a surprisingly rare event, the Moon being a much smaller object than most people think. This month there are actually six bright star occultations, with two visible in the UK and Western Europe. First we have the occultation of star Epsilon Tauri on the 5th of July at 3am British Summer Time, 2am Universal Time. And then on the 19th of July the Moon occults Beta Scorpi, also known as Graphius, at half past midnight at British Summer Time, half past 11 on the 18th in Universal Time. Depending on your location, you will see either a full occultation, where the star disappears and reappears, a grazing occultation, where the star appears to brush the edge of the moon, or you'll see a near miss. Do look up online for more information, we'll place links on the Awesome Astronomy Facebook group, and remember to set up in plenty of time to view, as the timings of these events are still quite imprecise. Moving on to the deep sky objects, it's the view of the southern sky that should hold your attention in July, as it's the time of year when many northern hemisphere observers get to have a little peek of the delights of the southern hemisphere. Sitting on the southern horizon will be the constellation of Sagittarius, with the famous teapot asterism and its famous nebulosity like steam rising from the spout, which is of course the Lagoon Nebula, the large and small Sagittarius star clouds, and of course the galactic centre. Here is the Milky Way at its densest, and for collectors of Messier objects, the low southern sky in July presents you with an opportunity to see 22 of them close together. Nebulas M8, 16, 17 and 20. Open clusters 6, 7, 11, 26, 18, 21, 23, 24, 25. And globular clusters 4, 10, 12, 19, 22, 54, 55, 62 and the bonus ball of 70. Bingo! This is also a great area for binocular astronomy, which I think many telescope owners tend to forget about, which is a shame as some objects and areas of the sky make for incredible views in a pair of binoculars. Sometimes a better view than the narrow close-up available in a telescope. Mm. M24, for instance, is considered one of the most dense and spectacular star fields you can view, and is in many respects a better binocular object than in a telescope. Certainly, globular cluster M22 is well worth a look, in both binoculars and telescope, as it is the biggest globular cluster that could be seen from the Northern Hemisphere, not, as many imagine, M13. So, find yourself a good clear southern horizon view and take in the galactic centre and its neighbourhood this month. Lastly, this month's sky guide are the meteors. We have a few showers in July, but mostly quite weak with low zenithal rates. The Capricorn shower has three peaks, the first on the 8th, the second on the 15th, and the last on the 26th, while the Delta Aquirids peak on the 30th. 
The Capricornians are an interesting shower as its parent body was at first identified as an asteroid, 2002 EX12, but subsequently this body was established to be a comet, now called 169P Neat. Of further interest is that although this shower is a weak one of bright, slow-moving meteors, the bulk of the material from the comet is not set to be in Earth's way until the 24th century, by which time it may be one of the great high-rate meteor storms. But of course, here in 2013, avid meteor fans will be looking forward to our own high-rate Perseids, which begin this month on the 23rd, with a peak occurring on the 12th of August. Before finishing, there is one extra mention to be made of a fun little event being lined up for the 19th of July by the team behind the Cassini probe, which of course is on its epic survey of Saturn. On this day, the probe is going to attempt a photo of home, a homage to the famous pale blue dot taken by Voyager. In a fun little conceit, everyone is asked to wave at Saturn at 27 minutes past 10 British summer time, 27 minutes past 9 universal time. The picture will take about 15 minutes. Don't forget to look up and remember this fantastic little probe circling Saturn. Of course, any images, sketches or observation reports of anything in this guide and anything we haven't mentioned, we would love to hear about on our Facebook group, via Twitter and our Flickr group. Uh, addresses at the end of the show. You were speaking about binocular viewing being particularly good this time of year, mm -hmm. Paul, so mm -hmm. we're absolutely delighted to be able to give away a pair of Celestron Skymaster 15 by 70 binoculars this month. That's right, the good people at Tring Astronomy Centre who are fans of the show have given us this great prize to give away to one lucky listener, wherever you are in the world. So do take a look at the Tring Astronomy Centre website at www.tringastro.co.uk. And all you need to do to win this prize is follow us on Twitter, that's at AwesomeAstroPod, and then email us to tell us what type of deep sky object Paul explains in this show's five-minute concept. Only emails to AwesomeAstroPod at gmail.com go into the draw. And good luck. This is Awesome Astronomy. Well, let's move on to the news now, and we start off with a possible change to our understanding of the Goldilocks zones. And the Goldilocks zone is an indicator of how far an Earth-sized planet's orbit must be from its star in order for life-critical water to exist as a gas, a liquid, and a solid. Now, that's not to say that Earth-sized planets in the Goldilocks zone of another star will have life, but it's the most sensible search we can conduct knowing that life has evolved under those conditions, at least here in our solar system. But interestingly, we've seen some research from Penn State University in the US that's awaiting publication in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, which challenges our understanding of Earth's place in our solar system's Goldilocks zone. Now, this research by Dr. Ravi Koparapu focuses on an increase in the number of exoplanets that may be habitable. That's based upon a new Penn State model of the size of the habitable zone around other stars. But if you apply this model to our solar system, it says that we're right on the edge of habitability ourselves. Now, this 2013 model revises the accepted Goldilocks zone devised by Koparapu's Penn State colleague, Professor James Casting, in 1993, and that's been the gold standard in all subsequent Earth analogue hunts. But this refinement places Earth just four lunar distances away from being heated by our sun to the extent that we'd suffer a runaway greenhouse effect, similar to that which suffocated any chance of life surviving on Venus. So that puts Earth in a much more precarious place in our solar system than originally thought, if this new model's right. So this has repercussions for how long the Earth will remain habitable, because we know that the Sun will begin to expand in the future, and this model suggests we may have only half the generally accepted time of a billion years left. Now, we do get a chance to test this theory, though you might need to get a stiff drink before you hear this next bit. Brace everybody, brace. Okay, you ready? Here goes. Regardless of whether you think global warming is man-made or due to natural climate cycles, the accepted UN consensus suggests that Earth will warm up by 3 to 4 degrees Celsius in this century. And as luck would have it, if you're an impartial observer, I don't know, say a Martian who's more interested in a scientific experiment than the comfort of humanity, that 3 to 4 degree heating would be the equivalent of putting Earth, would you believe, four lunar distances closer to the sun, and therefore outside the habitable zone within the next 90 years. Ooh. But natural carbon sequestration cycles and atmospheric conditions also have a big role to play here, with many experts believing that a far greater heating of the atmosphere is going to be required to kickstart an environmental smothering of the planet. So we have an experiment in play already, and someone gets to say, I told you so, <laughs> and you've got to have nerves of steel to play that game. So if Ravi Koparapu's right, while this puts Earth in a decidedly more precarious place in our solar system, 
It also means that there'll be far more planets in habitable zones around the small nearby M dwarf stars. But when you say nearby, that's relative, right? Yeah, the nearest of these M dwarf stars more than seven light years away, so it's much too far for us to travel to. But this puts at least eight potentially habitable planets within ten light years, and that's in our backyard. Cosmically speaking? Yeah, cosmically speaking. And their atmospheres can be examined for telltale chemical biosignatures by telescopes easier than planetary systems that are further away. And we also know that there are far more red dwarf stars than any other type in the galaxy. So, you know, we're playing the exoplanet odds and the odds are getting better year by year. Yeah, but we're not going to get alarmist by this Earth habitability talk because there are so many factors and variables um, that need to be included in any models that take atmospheres and climate cycles into account. Uh, that we're certainly not worried by this news, so please don't have nightmares and do sleep well. Yeah, exactly. These models get revised from time to time, and as more data and a greater understanding of planetary systems become apparent, and of course, better supercomputers become available. Anywho, moving on to round up the news this month, but first of all, sticking with habitable zones. By combining your observations with data from the High Accuracy Radial Velocity Planet Searcher, or HARPS instrument in Chile, the European Southern Observatory has revealed three planets orbiting within the habitable zone of the class M star Galice 667c, some 22 light years away in the constellation of Scorpius. Now, this system contains six, possibly seven planets in total. Three of them sit in the habitable zone and are what is termed super Earths in that they have masses between that of Earth and Uranus. And also shows that although the Kepler Exoplanet Hunting Telescope appears to have gone belly up, there's still going to be tons of stuff in the data it's already collected that hasn't been refined to reveal. Well, who knows what? Yeah, that's the silver lining we can take from it. And moving closer to home, it's been a busy month in spaceflight with a Russian supply ship undocking from the International Space Station in the middle of last month and being replaced with the European Automated Transfer Vehicle called Albert Einstein, uh, which both send fresh water, oxygen, food and any other consumables to the orbiting crew. And at the same time, we had the Chinese manned Shenzhou capsule docking with their Tiangong space station in an automatic manoeuvre before the astronauts then undocked and tried a manual docking manoeuvre on the 23rd of June. And these can be seen as crucial steps that need to be understood for any future Chinese space ambitions, like larger space stations or lunar missions, like the Americans had to master during the Gemini space programme in the 1960s. And to add to the clutter up there, another Russian supply ship's being launched later in July. Now, we don't hear much from the Mars Science Laboratory or MSL much these days, do we? It's because it didn't really go it's in a studio in California. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way that sky crane works. <laughs> well, if you believe what we're being told, it found some interesting clays showing past habitability on Mars a few months ago. <laughs> and then it had to suspend communications throughout April while the sun was between Earth and Mars. It then drilled another rock uh, to replicate earlier findings. It took images uh, for a billion pixel resolution of Martian landscape this month, which is well worth Googling for a look at, actually. Um, and now it's gone a little quiet. But it looks like NASA are now finishing off the exploration of this interesting Glen Elg region where MSL showed a stream bed had once flown. Then in a week or so, around mid-July, the rover will begin its five-mile trek to the main site of its exploration mission, Mount Sharp, the raised peak in Gale Crater that should reveal a geological timeline of this once habitable Martian region. But given that the rover's travelled less than half a mile in its ten months on Mars so far, and it'll no doubt find lots of interesting things to stop and examine on the way, it could also still take about a year to get to Mount Sharp, and I wouldn't bet against it given us more exciting news on its travels. But before moving away from MSL, last month we got the results from the radiation assessment detector that hitched a ride on Curiosity as it made its way to Mars. And this instrument took readings in space for several months, or all the way over to Mars, which have now been collated to tell us how dosed up humans would get on a conventional trip to the Red Planet. And unless astronauts can get there much faster than conventional rockets allow, or new lightweight radiation shielding technology can be developed, we note that Mars-bound astronauts can expect to get a hundred times more radiation exposure than they'd normally get on Earth because of this new data, which was likened to having a CT scan every five days, and it puts the risk of incurring fatal cancers from this radiation a little over the NASA's accepted risk of 3%. And this got me thinking about how much risk the average person is likely to go for, or they'd accept if they were going to another planet. 
And I've got to ask you, Paul, would you still go if your risk of developing a fatal cancer was 5% greater? Yeah, why not? What about 10%? Eh. Uh, there was a 1 in 3 chance of cancer in your lifetime anyway. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd bet my refractor that there'll always be astronauts that'd be willing to personally accept the risk far beyond the point that you or I had seen now as well. Mm, oh, yeah, I'm sure. Um, finally, for this month's news, we go extra galactic because the Chandra Space Telescope and ESA's XMM Newton Telescope, which can see the X-rays emitted by matter that gets superheated, swirling around a black hole before it falls in, have spotted what scientists think is 26 black holes in our neighbouring galaxy Andromeda. Hmm. And this is the most that have ever been detected in another galaxy as well, and are thought to be just the tip of the iceberg. So, not earth-shattering news, but it's always nice when we find new stuff and. Black holes are cool. Oh, black holes are very cool. Well, well, no, they're very hot. Very hot. Very hot. On the outside, we don't know what they're like inside. Well, yeah. You've got to guess hot, though. Mm. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff in there. This is Awesome Astronomy. And now we turn our attention to explaining a little more about this incredible universe we live in. And in this month's five-minute concept... Paul's looking at one of the most beautiful and bizarre class of objects in the sky, globular clusters. They're perhaps one of the most beautiful and enigmatic objects you can see in the sky with a small scope, but at the same time they're all too often overlooked. In an astronomy world obsessed with imaging nebula and galaxies, poor old globular clusters get shunned. Yet here is a truly mysterious object that is both beautiful and not properly understood, a genuine astronomy puzzle that you can see from your back garden. They aren't typically a large object in the eyepiece. There are only four that are truly naked eye objects. In order, Omega Centauri, 47 Toucanet, both in the southern hemisphere, and M22 and M13 in the north. Even with these brighter four, we are talking about apparent diameters between 36 and 17 arc minutes, with most others smaller than this. These are little jewels, not wide field filling emission nebulas. I say little, M13 is 145 light years across, and therein lies the beginning of the wonder. These objects are a very, very long way off. The Great Globular Cluster in Hercules, or M13, is a group of about 300,000 stars, and it sits over 25,000 light years from Earth. If M13 were as close as that amateur favourite M42, the Great Orion Nebula, it would appear more than 10 times larger and fill the bottom half of the constellation. It would blaze away almost like a second sun. While they are part of the overall structure of the Milky Way, globular clusters are essentially satellites of the main spiral disk, and in some respects can be thought of as mini-galaxies. At present, 152 globs have been observed from predicted 180, the furthest being NGC 2419, which at 300,000 light-years distance was for a long while thought not to be part of the Milky Way, and so earned the nickname the Intergalactic Wanderer, but is still part of our galaxy and takes an incredible 3 billion years to make one trip around. At an estimated age of 12.3 billion years, these enigmatic objects are ancient. One of the closest, NGC 6397, has been used to estimate the age of the Milky Way, and the astronomers came back with a staggering 13.4 billion years for the age of the cluster. This makes it not much younger than the universe itself. When you're looking at a globular cluster, you're witnessing one of the universe's oldest artefacts. Of course, saying NGC 6397 is close is relative. It is still over 7,000 light years away, the light you see from it started out 3,000 years before the Egyptians threw up the Great Pyramid. But then the light from the Wanderer began its journey to your eye when evolution had just produced a new ape called Homo sapien. Such is the vast scale of the Milky Way. That's incredible. I, it, it is amazing, isn't it? So what are they? The simple answer is a compact gravity-bound grouping of stars, but this doesn't answer the question of how or why. They're an ongoing mystery and poorly understood. How they formed is still a major area of research, and even the distances and ages are subject to quite large error margins. One hint is a superstar cluster called Westerland 1. Discovered in 1961, about 14,000 light years away, it appears to be in the process of becoming a globular cluster. Globs are filled with exotic objects, bright X-ray sources, pulsars, white dwarfs, as well as fascinating oddities like blue stragglers, a type of star discovered in a survey of M3 in 1953 by astronomer Alan Sandage. The stars were more luminous, more massive and bluer than what was expected. They're still not understood, and theories of stellar collision or mass transference in a binary are put forward as explanations. Interactions are common in globular clusters. Distances between stars that are not binaries can be measured in light days or months, while in the core, light distances are measured in hours and minutes. The centre of globs may have a black hole at their core, or a group of neutron stars, or maybe even a cluster of white dwarf stars. And it's thought that stars at the core of the cluster 
accrete onto each other, the cluster slowly collapsing in on itself as it appears to be happening in M15 in Pegasus, a cluster that may have a black hole in its core. Because of their age, they are made up of population 2 stars that appear to contain too few heavy elements to allow planetary formation. So while planets appear to be common here in the galactic disk, blobs may be planetary deserts, which makes the Arecibo message beamed towards M13 in 1974 a waste of time even beyond the fact M13 will have moved away from the bit of sky the message was aimed at. Of course, with such a mysterious and secretive object, there is a twist. For while everything I have said so far has been held to be accurate over the last few decades, more recent evidence has thrown up exceptions. M4 has thrown up a planet. A 2008 study of X-ray binaries in clusters suggested that some of them were much younger than previously thought. And then to really spice things up, five years ago, the optical SETI program, run by the University of Western Sydney, detected a possible laser signal from 47 Tukane. This is Awesome Astronomy. Thanks for that, Paul. Now, with NASA's Curiosity rover grabbing most of the headlines in space exploration recently, I spoke with Dr. Jorge Vargo, who's the European Space Agency's project scientist for the upcoming ExoMars astrobiology mission. Jorge obtained his doctorate in space plasmas and planetary physics from Cornell University, moved to the European Space Agency to project manage the development of space laboratories for the Russian Space Agency and the International Space Station, and is now engrossed in the upcoming ExoMars mission so who better to ask about Easter's hunt for life on the Red Planet? Hi Jorge and welcome to Awesome Astronomy. Hi Ralph, pleasure to be here. Uh, well, as the European Space Agency project scientist for the upcoming ExoMars mission, you must have been watching NASA's Curiosity rover land and now explore the surface of Mars with quite some interest. But next up is your exciting plan to explore Mars with the ExoMars project. So can you tell me a little about ExoMars? Sure. There's a first mission in 2016, and that will send an orbiter around Mars. Uh, this orbiter will be devoted to the study of the atmosphere of Mars, and in particular, something called trace gases. Mm -hmm. The second part of this first mission is we will deliver a small capsule to the surface of Mars. It doesn't have a lot of science, and it will only last for a couple of days. But the purpose of that is for Europe to learn how to land on Mars. Mm -hmm. So this is a mission in 2016. The one that is closest to my heart is the, the one coming afterwards in 2018. And that one will send a rover to the surface of Mars with a purpose to look for traces of past life. Uh, in fact, the ExoMars program or missions are, are not done only by ESA, but we do them in cooperation with uh, the Russian Federal Space Agency, Roscosmos. So from the initial idea to the go-ahead to build the mission and then from launch to payload deployments, can you tell me how the timeline for the ExoMars missions progressed? Oh, well, it's been long and painful, I can tell you that. <laughs> we started with the idea of putting together an exobiology rover in 2002. And I have to say, in the beginning, we were a bit naive. But, uh, oh, well. You say naive. Why naive? Well, naive because um, we probably underestimated uh, for example, how much mass would be required for doing certain things, what the size of a rover would be. Initially, we thought we could go with a smaller rocket. And over the years, as we uh, studied the mission more and more, you know, we got more realistic. Yeah. So initially, we started uh, looking at uh, the rover mission as a European-only mission. In 2009, we were told, look, this mission is great but it's costing quite a bit more than what uh, we think we are uh, ready to put on the table right now. How about a bit of international cooperation? And so at the end of 2009, beginning of 2010, we turned toward NASA and we said, well, couldn't we somehow combine your plans with our plans and put together a mission? And um, it looked like we would look uh, at two landing two rovers on an MSL-like uh, sky crane. Um, we worked on it a little bit more, and then we decided that two rovers on a single platform was a no-go. And then NASA got into, let's say, some budgetary uncertainties. And, well, that was the end of that cooperation. And then we turned to Roscosmos, and they were very enthusiastic. 
right from the outset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were very enthusiastic. Uh, by then, we were well on our way with the preparations for the Trace Gas Orbiter mission. And, and so we basically kept the scheme of two separate missions. And that's what we're working on now. And around a decade ago, um, ESA's Mars Express Orbiter discovered that Mars's atmosphere contains methane that varies in concentration over time. Can you tell me what we currently know about this and why this is so intriguing to the search for life on Mars? Sure. First of all, let me tell you that there have been three putative detections of methane. Mm -hmm. One is the one from Mars Express. MSL looked for methane recently where they are, and they didn't find any. They have looked twice, and uh, they don't detect anything. Now, it could be that it's a wrong season. It could be that they're in the wrong place. Definitely, methane is interesting because if the observation is confirmed, its origin could be one of two things. In both cases, it would point to a planet that is alive. Mm -hmm. In one case, geologically, uh, methane could be coming out from some uh, volcanic activity or more likely some hydrothermal process. The other possible explanation is that there are subsurface bacteria that exhale methane. So being replenished by microbial life. Yeah. So the first thing we need to do is, is check whether there is methane or not. Uh -huh. The instruments we have not only can look at methane, but can look at all the other, let's say, trace gases. And by looking at the association of the various species, you can probably say something intelligent as to the origin whether it's biological or, or more geological. And generally talking about sources for it, do you think you'll be able to get an indication of whether it is geological or astrobiological? Yeah, I think so, yes. And, and how will uh, ExoMars differentiate? Well, what you do is you look, at, uh, you look at methane, but you also look at all the other species like ethane and the degradation products of methane and of, and of the other uh, hydrocarbons in infrared window. Mm -hmm. If you see a broad range of uh, hydrocarbons coming out, maybe you could make a, a better case for it being volcanic. Yeah. Whereas if it is uh, more specialized, as, as life often specializes and, and uses only certain kind of molecules, then you, you have a better case for it being biological. So can you tell us about the instruments on your rover and how they differ from Curiosity's geological analysis to make ExoMars the rover that the public have probably always been waiting for, that is, an astrobiological prospector? Yeah, the instruments we have in our rover are amazing. So we have a, a mast, and on the mast we have a stereo pair of cameras, and these are what uh, give us our stereo vision and allows us to build panoramas. Then... In between that stereo pair, so in the center between these two cameras, there is a, what we call the high-resolution camera. Mm -hmm. So it gives you roughly a factor of somewhere between 8 and 10 in magnification. And this is important because when you're trying to figure out in which direction you want to go, having this sort of telescopic reach is very useful. Yes. You can imagine if you have 10 different rocks, uh, more or less in the distance, and you have to figure out which one is juicier. Yeah. It helps if you can if you can have high resolution uh, information. So let's say you you find something in the distance and you decide to go that way. Eventually, you will get to let's say an outcrop. Now the next thing you want to do is you want to study that rock and uh, first of all see if it is the right type of minerals that might be, for example, indicate the past presence of water that might be useful for preserving biosignatures. Mm -hmm. Let's assume that the rock is interesting. So what do you do next? Well, you still do not want to collect samples from the rocks you see on the surface. The reason is that because Mars has a very tenuous atmosphere, um, the surface gets bathed in ionizing radiation that is not stopped by the atmosphere, it is stopped actually by, by the surface. The ionizing radiation actually penetrates into the ground and it has the effect of very slowly, over millions of years, destroying the biosignatures you want to detect. So you need to get deeper. You need to go deep, yeah. And you need to go, if you're targeting something older than a couple of billion years, you need to go beyond the meter. Uh -huh. So what we try to do with ExoMars is we try to see how the rocks map 
under the surface and actually go and collect the sample for analysis from the right type of rock, not from the surface, but from the subsurface. And to do that, we have two interesting instruments. One is a ground penetrating radar. Uh, this is a high frequency instrument that gets roughly three to five meters uh, into the ground. The first day you start drilling, you go down, let's say, 50 centimeters. At night, because the temperature gets down to like minus 120 degrees, we retrieve the drill, we bring it back into the rover. The next day, you go into the same hole and drill another 50 centimeters. The third day, you go back into the same hole and you see how it takes like four days before you can get <laughs> to where you want to go. Slow but sure. Yeah. And hopefully the things, the sedimentary deposits that we find at the at depth will have had uh, quite a bit of protection from this dust on top. And we will have the best chances then to find uh, organic molecules. So then uh, when we are done with the drilling, we collect a little sample. And then the drill goes up in front of the rover, uh, tilts to the side, and then there's a little hand that comes out from the front of a rover and the drill deposits the sample on this little hand. And then the sample is ingested, it's crushed, and it's passed on the instruments in the analytical laboratory. We have first a visible and infrared imaging spectrometer going all the way from the visible to the carbonate band in the infrared. Mm -hmm. And this is very useful because um, we analyze uh, the bands in each one of the images and then we can, we can figure out what the minerals in the crashed sample are. Mm -hmm. The third instrument is the largest instrument in the payload and is the one devoted to the search for organic molecules. And it can work in two ways. Uh, one way is the usual way, the way of Viking and the way of MSL. And that is you put sample in an oven, you heat it up, and hopefully the organic molecules come out and you can detect them. The other way, which is a new way, is the ExoMars way, is you fire a laser and you get the organic molecules to detach with a laser light. And this is new and it's very, very important. But uh, this instrument is, is, is the one that we look for organics. When Viking landed on Mars in 1976 and they put the soil samples in the oven, heated them up and looked for organic molecules with a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, they didn't find any. And uh, people were very upset and uh, particularly because since about 300 tons per year of organic material comes onto the terrestrial planets, whether it's Earth or Mars, they were expecting to find tons of organic. This is not life organics, but organics of cosmic origin that comes in the form of very fine meteor or cometary dust. They thought they would find, I don't know, a meter of this stuff on the Martian surface, and instead they didn't find anything. So this combined with the other three instruments that were looking for the uh, metabolic uh, processes that you might find on cells, uh, led them to think that there was some crazy inorganic chemistry going on, some oxidant species that was somehow responsible for the signatures. Uh -huh. And then, let's say, people didn't think about this for a long time until Phoenix landed in 2009 but they found a, a pretty exotic anion, which is perchlorate. Um, they're neutral at uh, room temperature, but when you heat them to a, a few hundred degrees, they, they release the oxygen uh, they have in there. They're very powerful oxidizers. And then when, when people saw this result in, uh, in Phoenix, they went back to the Viking results and said, wait a second, if there was also perchlorate at the Viking site and we were heating up the samples to release the organics, maybe we were activating these perchlorates and actually destroying the organics. MSL has found the same thing now. So it is likely that these perchlorates are everywhere on Mars. Uh -huh. But discovering organics isn't the same as discovering life, is it? So how will we be able to differentiate between simple organics, complex organics and something that is actually alive? Well, if it's actually something alive, it's really easy, because uh, in that case, you will see the molecules in a pristine state. So you will start to think, see things like uh, amino acids and, and phospholipids, which are the, the Lego bricks of cell membranes. Mm -hmm. You might be able to see sugars. Where it gets tricky is when you're looking at not nifty present-day organics, but organics that were deposited three and a half billion years ago. Yeah. What you're looking at there are organic residues. And then you have to do a bit of detective work and try to see if you can connect 
the residues to a plausible case for the past uh, biological activity. So some of these families of molecules I was talking about, when they degrade, they degrade into other families of molecules. So if you are able to detect those, then you can make a, a good case for recognizing what the mother molecule may have been. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you have to increase your chances of being able to make a decent biosignature detection. And the way you do that is you have to land in the right place. Yeah. 100% of the scientific quality of the, what the ExoMars rover will deliver in terms of biosignatures depends on targeting the right site. You want mm-hmm. to go to an old site, ancient, 4 billion years or so, older is po- if possible, a site where you can make a very good case that there was water in the past and that there were massive sedimentary deposits that were not brought there from somewhere else, but that were actually deposited in place so, so that they are indigenous from that area. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're quite comfortable saying, though, that if life is there, whether it's current life or past life, ExoMars will be able to tell. So this mission, the way it's been conceived is we're going after past life. Yeah. But we have instruments that if present life were to be at the place where we land, at a depth that we can reach with a drill, then we would be able to detect it also. Mm-hmm. Or here on Earth, when they drill for oil at depths of several kilometers, they find life all the time. There are bacteria living very boring uh, existences, just uh, in the dark, feeding off uh, um, iron or sulfur, changing their valence state and in the process gaining an electron to sustain their their life. And and actually, they, if you look at in terms of mass, there's more life in terms of kilos in the subsurface on Earth than above the surface. <laughs> so maybe there's life on Mars in the subsurface where it's probably liquid water, but uh, I, I don't think it would be very easy to find that out. Uh-huh. Well, it was a pleasure speaking with you this month, Jorge. We're going to be watching the mission with great interest, and we wish you every success. Dr. Jorge Vargo, thank you for speaking with us on Awesome Astronomy. Thank you. This is Awesome Astronomy. Okay, well, now we turn our attention to you and let you dictate the content of the show with the questions and answers section of the program. So just a reminder that you can send in any astronomy-related questions or challenges to us via email, Facebook, or Twitter addresses at the end of the show. Okay, we've got some great questions again this month, and we'll kick off with a question for you, Paul, on the magnitude scale. So, Darren Knight asks, Guys, a question for the show. When referring to magnitude, why is minus brighter than plus? And what would a benchmark of zero be? Hmm, Darren's right. It's Uh, counterintuitive. And what's so special about Vega that it gets to be the centre of the magnitude scale? Well, this is one of my astronomy bugbears, actually. Blame the ancient Greeks... Um, of course can do no wrong, um, even when they are. <laughs> the magnitude scale was first devised by a chap called Hipparchus, who was an astronomer. Um, he created the first comprehensive star catalogue, founded trigonometry and made observations of the precession of the equinoxes. So pretty amazing. When it came to stars, he divided them into six categories of brightness, with the top 20 being magnitude 1. This didn't include the sun, and of course in his defence nobody knew what stars were, how far away they were, um, that there were even more stars to be seen if he had just had a telescope. In this original system each magnitude was twice the brightness of the previous. So magnitude 5 was twice as bright as magnitude 6, while magnitude 4 was four times brighter than magnitude 6. Magnitude 3 was eight times brighter, etc. Making magnitude 1 stars 32 times brighter than magnitude 6. It was naked eye astronomy, so you know, over 2,000 years ago they had little equipment, they had a thing for hemlock and slaves, so I'm not going to be too critical, but I'm not going to defend the Victorian astronomer Norman Pogson. He gave us the modern system. 1856, steam engines, telegraphs, massive moustaches, and most importantly, big telescopes. <laughs> so, did Pogson start with a clean sheet? No, of course not. He decided to play around with the Greek, and therefore good, system. He did make it more accurate and made magnitude 1 100 times brighter than magnitude 6. This means Pogson's ratio, the fifth root of 100, if you're interested, uh, magnitude 1 is 2.512 brighter than magnitude 2. He fixed Polaris as a magnitude 2 star and worked from there. Unfortunately, Polaris is a variable, so there was a switch to Vega, which became 0, which then left us with Sirius at magnitude minus 1.4, the sun down at minus 26, 
and a full moon a shade over minus 13. Yeah, I know, exactly. So in short, Greeks started it, the Victorians fiddled with it, and now we have a system where zero is not the brightest star, every jump in magnitude is an increase or decrease in brightness of 2.512, and, well, out of interest, the Hubble telescope sees down to magnitude 30, and the planned European Extremely Large Telescope will see down to magnitude 36. So I hope that clears it up for you, Darren. Blame the Greeks. Well, the Victorians. And the Greeks. Victorians. Okay, and coming to us via Twitter, at Cosmic Ray Girl from Scotland, asked us to tell her more about the Sun's 11-year cycle. Ralph. Yeah, and all this stems from the German astronomer Samuel Heinrich Schwab, who studied our Sun over a prolonged period in the early 1800s, and he discovered that the number of dark spots on the Sun increased and decreased in a repeated pattern over time. Now, subsequent observations and a troll through historical records of sunspot numbers refined our understanding of this pattern to our currently understood cycle of an average of 11 years or so. And that's to go from minimal activity through maximum activity and then back to going quiet again, or the solar cycle. Now, saying that, since Schwab's discovery, solar astronomers have observed cycles that have been as short as 7 years and others that have been as long as 14 years although these longer ones are thought to be where two cycles may have kind of merged together, so they're by no means accurate timekeepers, and even today that prevents us from knowing when a minimum or maximum has occurred until we're moving back out of that period. But the effects that are most noticeable to amateur astronomers of this cycle are the less impressive views of the solar disk during minimums, when there are fewer sunspots and solar flares to observe, compared to maximums when there are daily views of these active solar features. We now know that this is due to varying activity in the Sun caused by its magnetic field flipping polarity, like turning a magnet around. So every 11 years, the Sun's North Pole becomes its South Pole, and vice versa. And when this happens, we get increased activity in the Sun, and this kicks out more energy. It churns up more plasma and often hurls this plasma out into space as solar flares, or its larger cousin, the coronal mass ejection. As an interesting aside, the magnetic reversal, as it's known, also happens on Earth too, though the Earth's magnetic field only flips about every half million years on average. And neither reversals on the Sun or the Earth are dangerous to humans unless you're on a spacecraft outside the Earth's protective magnetic field when the Sun starts hurling more plasma into space. Now, it can fry satellites that can't be put in safe mode and can cause the Earth's atmosphere to bloat and create more drag on satellites, which can then cause them to deorbit. But the only major effects on Earth are power outages caused by the very rare severe coronal mass ejections which oversurge electrical grid transmission lines, and of course the beautiful auroras that become more intense and frequent during solar maximums. So there's just about as much to enjoy about these maximums as we should concern ourselves with. Now conversely, long minimums can lead to prolonged cold climate spells often referred to as mini ice ages. The famous Maunder minimum from around 1650 to 1715 caused global temperatures to plummet, glaciers to spread further south and major European rivers to freeze. So coming back to the present, as the last solar maximum was in the year 2000, we now suspect that two solar cycles may well have merged into one again because there was no peak around 2011-2012. And if 2013 is the peak, it's a rather quiet solar maximum, and we won't know for certain until after it has peaked. But nonetheless, there's still plenty to see on the sun through specialist solar filters, and auroras are more common at the moment in extreme northern and southern latitudes, so don't worry about the low peak we're in. It's giving amateur astronomers plenty to observe. And we've had a very bizarre question coming in, so we can't really ignore this one, and this one comes from Neil Hawkins on Facebook, and Neil asks, If you placed hobnobs together in a long line, how many would it take to reach <laughs> M31? And I should say for our non-English listeners that hobnobs are a biscuit or a cookie in Britain. Right then, over uh, to you, Paul. Yeah, Good luck with oh, that go on, one. go on. Time, time for a bit of bit of <laughs> get the calculator. Bit out. of science, right? Okay, <laughs> um, okay. Well, I've got some hobnobs here, so let's get Ooh, get a, me. get a hobnob out of a hobnob. Lovely, right? Okay, hobnob. Then let's measure it. Um, I make that. Let Let's round that up. Oh, that's going to be ten centimeters, hundred millimeters. So punching into the calculator. You're going to need a lot of digits There's on that a screen. lot of digits on there. Mm. Um, right, okay, I make that. Okay, let's, let's, let's go through through a little bit of the maths there. Um, we're going to talk about parsecs. Um, another hobnob. Another hobnob. Oh, we've got to have another hobnob. 
Um, a parsec is a measurement that is used in astronomy when we, we start getting to the, the sort of bigger measurements beyond light years. Um, a parsec is 3.26 light years. Um, of course, Andromeda is a long way away, so we're going to talk about uh, kiloparsecs. So, kiloparsec, a thousand parsecs. Um, a parsec is 30. 0.857 times 10 to the 15 meters. This is a long way. This is a very long way. So 10 centimeter for a hobnob, we're going to divide that number by 10 centimeters. So <laughs> we're looking at, get this, uh, there we go, um, that's 2.4063 times 10 to the 24 hobnobs. That's a septillion. That's 2.4063 septillion hobnobs to the Andromeda Galaxy. I hope they enjoy them when they get there. <laughs> I'm going to have another one. Um, I think there's, there's a follow-up question. What is the heaviest object known in our solar system, and if you were to place it on one side of a set of scales, how many hobnobs, milk chocolate, would you need to counterbalance it? There's a big hobnob hobnob fetish going on there's here, a isn't big there? hobnob fetish going on there um right okay time for another hobnob um right let's get the scales okay i'm making that hobnob that looks like 14 grams to me 14 15 grams let's say 14 grams so i'm going with the first number of course the heaviest object in the solar system it's a trick question of course it's the sun patrick moore said the solar system is the sun jupiter and some bits <laughs> but it's mainly the sun. Now, the sun is 1.99 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. Without Wikipedia, I'm going to take your word for that. So, we're going to divide that by 14 grams. <laughs> <sighs> Thanks, Neil. So, we're looking at 1.4207 times 10 to the 32 <laughs> hobnobs will equal the sun. And if you've got that number of hobnobs together, I'm sure they would actually start... A fusion reaction. <laughs> um, so, yes. Thanks for that, Neil. Um, thanks hope, very much, hope Neil. Hope you enjoy the answer. <laughs> and finally, we'll both tackle science and fiction's question, who you can find on Twitter as at Sci and Five Films. And they ask, what's your favourite galaxy? Ours is a dead tie between the Milky Way and the Whirlpool Galaxy. Hoag's Object, though. Weak source. And before I bring you in here, Paul, just to say, Hoag's Object is a really beautiful oh, and yeah, unusual yeah. galaxy. Mm. And you really should Google it and, and take a look at it. And what's brilliant is there's another one just behind... Well, to say just behind it, in the it's same a field long of view. way behind it. Yeah, but yeah. It, it's the most unusual object. And you see it, and then there's another one. Another object just the same yeah. way. It's got this like ring-like appearance that's probably due to past collision that started some kind of rapid star formation and then pushed these stars away from that older core. So do take a look at it online because it really is a beautiful deviation from the norm. So, Paul, if we put our own Milky Way in the Whirlpool Galaxy and Ursa Major to one side, what are you going with as your favourite galaxy? Um, oh, that's so difficult. I'm going to go with one you can see. Um, so I'm going to go with M87. Good choice. Uh, it's, it's fast. I mean, it's probably the largest galaxy we know of. Mm-hmm. Um, it's visible visually in a telescope. Um, you don't need to image it to find it. Um, but not too impressive to look at. No, scope, it's it? not. It's not. It's one of those objects, I think, if you know something about it and mm. just how big it is and how far away it is, it's more impressive. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's, you can't see it, but it's got a, a jet in the centre, which probably do with a sort of supermassive black hole. And it's 5,000 light years long. When you see it in a different part of the spectrum you get to see this really extended galaxy that's just it's shooting just, out on either sides into space and filling so much area. Yeah, yeah exactly. It, it, it's, it's a vast, vast galaxy, and it completely dwarfs the Milky Way. Well, I'll pick one that's nice to observe and nice to image, and I'm a fan of edge-on-spiral galaxies, so I'm going to go for NGC 4565, also known as the Needle oh, Galaxy. that's lovely, yeah. It is yeah. such a stunning galaxy, and there's a lot of nice edge-on-spiral galaxies. But I'm going for this because not only is it visible through a medium-sized amateur scope at this time of year up in the constellation of Coma Berenices, but I think it shows the turbulence that exists in galactic spiral mm -hmm. arms. The arms show us a dark band that cuts through the bright central bulge of the galaxy and it's illuminated at the edges to reveal this swirling gas and dust and it's quite a spectacular sight and a great object for amateur astronomers to image too. Yeah, and visible as an observed object as well. Yeah, and it's well worth taking a look mm. at. 
This is Awesome Astronomy. Well, that's the hour almost used up again, so just to remind you that if you want to join in the discussions, send us your images or make suggestions to the show, you can join the Facebook group, follow us on Twitter at AwesomeAstroPod or email us at AwesomeAstroPod at gmail.com. Don't forget to enter the competition to win those great binoculars by following us on Twitter and then emailing us with a subject for Paul's five-minute concept in this show. Oh yeah, and we also have the dates for the next Astro Camp. You can join us for a fun and friendly weekend of astronomy for all abilities. Yep, um, absolute beginners especially welcome from the 7th to the 10th September 2013. And I'm especially looking forward to kicking back with a milk chocolate hobnob dipped in a steaming cup of English breakfast tea. Yeah, absolutely. Laced with milk from cows grazing under the dark skies of the Brecon Beacons. Sounds perfect, doesn't it? Mm. We now also have an awesome astronomy YouTube channel with animations from Cydonia Base previewing episodes, so if you haven't already, do check that out. And do you think anyone actually listens to the end, Paul? I don't think so. Mm, I don't well, think they notice. By this point, they've probably suffered enough, but if you haven't ever listened until the end of the closeout music, that's where we hide the secret bloopers, and they're different to the ones in the end-of-year special. Any other notices you want to add there, Paul? No, I, I think that's it for this month. Okay, well, until next month, enjoy July skies, and it's goodbye from Cydonia Base. Goodbye. <laughs> Awesome Astronomy is produced by Ralph Wilkins and Paul Hill and is free to distribute for educational purposes. Music is courtesy of Star Salzman. For more information about this podcast, visit our website at www.awesomeastronomy.com. You can join in the astronomy discussion on our Facebook group and you can follow us on Twitter at AwesomeAstroPod. We invite your questions to read out on the show. You can send them to us via Facebook, Twitter, or by email at awesomeastropod at gmail.com. We thank you very much for listening. From Cydonia Base, end of transmission. Ooh, lives in a lobby of cluster oil. Like Love this. <laughs> <laughs> The universe is littered with galaxies, all with a halo of globular clusters. That's my... Lloyd Grossman. That's my Lloyd Grossman. <laughs> <laughs>